Imagine you live in a country that has existed in a continuous form for hundreds, nay, for a thousand years. How would you think about the early founders of your country? Would you view those times in a romanticized version? Would you see those times as the good old days? Or would you think what utterly dark times those must have been and how lucky you are to live in much better times when said country you live in has become so much better than it used to be? This is maybe how the late Romans felt, living in a state that had existed for many centuries. So how did the late Romans view the early Romans? Did a Roman who lived in the Rome of the year 450 AD look back fondly on the days of Caesar or Augustus? Or would she or he have looked back with disdain onto the cruel practices of the old Romans thinking himself of living in better times? It must have been utterly fascinating to live in a state that claimed to have a continuous existence for over a thousand years. In the year 450 of our calendar, Common Era, when the Western Roman Empire still existed, you would have lived in the year 1203 of the Roman calendar, which began with the founding of the city of Rome. So in the year 1203 up Urbe Condita, as the Romans would say. The Romans counted their years from that legendary date, which is dated to the year 753 BC. So in 450 AD, you would have thought to live in a state with a continuous existence for over a millennium. Because even the late Romans continued to refer to the Roman Empire as the Republic, as if the Roman Republic still existed. The term SPQR, Senatus et Populusque Romanus, was used until the very end of the Western Roman Empire. But how did the late Romans, so the Romans who lived from the early 4th century AD onwards, view the early Romans, so the Romans who lived a few hundred years before them? That is an interesting question which we will try to solve now based on some literary sources. As you can probably already guess, the way that a Roman from 350, 450 or even 550 AD would have viewed the Romans from hundreds of years earlier would of course strongly depend on if he or she was a Christian or a pagan. The worldview of the Christians and pagans diverged pretty dramatically on average and so naturally of course you would therefore also find very different opinions about the early Romans. However, some Romans would continue to be universally acclaimed by both Christians and pagans. These were legendary figures such as Julius Caesar, Octavian Augustus or Traianus. Especially after the crisis of the 3rd century, it became clear to many Romans that the times were probably not as good anymore as they had been hundreds of years earlier. And so especially the Roman Senate would continue to put these figures onto a pedestal. For instance, the expression Felicior Augusto, Melior Traiano was a phrase used by the Senate of Rome for well after the 4th century AD, probably even into the 5th century in the Western Roman Empire. The last elevation of a Western Roman Emperor by the Senate of Rome happened in 474 AD when Julius Nepos was confirmed as Imperator by the Senate and it is quite probable that the same sentence Felicior Augusto Milior Traiano, be happier than Augustus and better than Trajan was used to wish Nepos the best of success, that he may be an emperor as divinely favored as Augustus and better than Trajan himself. Unfortunately, these wishes didn't do Nepos any good and only six years later Julius Nepos was killed in the palace of Diocletian at Salona, thus ending the line of Western Roman emperors. Apart from the Senate, who viewed figures such as Caesar, Augustus and Trajan as the utmost ideal rulers, whose ideals any new emperor could only hope to even remotely reach, the imperial cult itself carried on well into the 4th century until these cults became less and less favored by the later, more radical Christian emperors such as Theodosius. The imperial cult worshipped the emperors as godly figures. In Rome, 
There was, for instance, the temple of the divine Julius Caesar, Divus Julius, in which Julius Caesar was remembered as a godly figure that had brought the Roman Republic great glory. Similarly, the other members of Caesar's dynasty, Augustus himself down to Claudius, were also deified upon their deaths and worshipped as gods. The imperial cult survived well into the late 4th century AD, and so of course the old emperors were often viewed in a very favorable light by both Christians and pagans of the late Roman Empire. Interesting side note, the last emperor in the West that was deified upon his death, thus officially receiving the title of Divus, was Libius Severus, who died in 465 AD, one of the last emperors of the Western Roman Empire. In the East, meanwhile, Emperor Anastasius I was the last emperor known to have been consecrated as Divus, therefore as a god upon his death in 518 AD. So the old emperors were indeed seen in a very positive light by the late Romans in general, and of course also by the emperors themselves, who strived to become a second Trajan or Augustus. We know for example that the emperor Julian strived to be like Marcus Aurelius, a philosopher on the throne, and he saw Marcus as the ideal ruler, trying to imitate his ruling style. In general, we can say that pagans viewed the old times very favorably, since they thought themselves of living in a decaying empire, and so they longed to live in the good old days. Hello dear friends of late Roman history, it's me, Sebastian, the creator and the person behind Majorianus. I apologize for this brief interruption, but I wanted to ask for your help to support Majorianus and to support the channel, so that we can keep Majorianus a channel about late Roman history. As you know, the YouTube algorithm is often not very kind to niche topics such as late Roman history, and therefore I really need your support in order to keep Majorianus the way it is, to keep it a channel about late Roman history, so that we can continue to explore this most fascinating era of the late Roman Empire, and so that we won't have to turn Majorianus into a mainstream history channel. Only a few euros per month of support can really make all the difference. Thanks for considering to support me via Patreon or via a YouTube membership. I cannot thank you people enough, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Majorian himself would be proud. Thank you friends of late Roman history and back to the video. Vegetius, for instance, a writer of the late 300s and early 400s AD, in his work De Re Militari, in which he describes in detail the units and tactics of the late Roman army, longed for the good old times of the old legions, finding the old legions of Augustus or Trajan superior to the late Roman legions. He decried the lack of the old fighting prowess and the lack of discipline in the late legions and I am pretty sure that he would have loved to live in the old times of the early empire or late republic, since in his works he was very biased against the late Roman army. An unfair bias, as I described in earlier videos, where I tried to show that the late Roman army was in fact not really inferior to the early Roman army. Anyhow, his view of the early Romans thus was very favorable, and he thought himself of living in a decaying empire of declining military prowess and virtue. One of the most famous late Roman history chroniclers was Ammianus Marcellinus, a friend of the Emperor Julian himself, who traveled and fought with Julian in many wars. Later in his life, in the early 380s AD, Ammianus went to Rome and there he witnessed and lamented the decadence of the rich senators and aristocrats of the city, who often held huge banquets, were dressed in expensive silken robes and displayed their wealth in an exaggerated manner in public. He idealized the good old times of his ideal writers Cicero or Tacitus and, as many other pagans, felt himself somehow out of place as if living in the wrong time. Another late Roman pagan who found himself out of place, looking back fondly onto the good old times, was Zosimus, a historian who lived in Constantinople during the reign of Emperor Anastasius I. 
We don't know exactly when he was born or when he died, but he was active from around 490 to 510 AD, so at a time when there was no Western Roman Emperor anymore, and when Theoderic, king of the Ostrogoths, reigned officially in the name of Anastasius over the areas of the former Western Roman Empire. As a pagan, it should come as no surprise that he was highly critical of the Christian emperors and their policies, he often criticized Constantine and his sons and Theodosius for their anti-pagan policies, and longed back to the good old days when Greco-Roman polytheism was the main religion of the Roman Empire and Christianity was but a small and unimportant sect. Many pagans in fact saw Christianity as the main culprit that was to blame for the misfortunes which had befallen the late Roman Empire. They saw this as a punishment by the old gods for turning away from them. Damascius was of a similar opinion. He was one of the last active Neoplatonists and he lived from around 460 AD until around 540. From him, we have for instance the fascinating account that Antemius, one of the last Western Roman emperors, was supposedly a secret pagan and that he attempted the revival of the old traditions at Rome, even going as far as secretly planning the restoration of the old temple of Jupiter on the Capitoline Hill. As you can imagine, Damascus was not very happy with the current situation of pagans, especially because the emperor Justinian, who reigned in those times, had decided to defund the Neoplatonic Academy of Athens in 529 AD, thus ending this old institution that had stood for almost a thousand years, going back to Plato himself. Though Damascus was careful not to write too much about his dislike of Christianity, always choosing a quite neutral tone, it is pretty clear, however, that he would have loved to live in earlier times of the Roman Empire, where he could have taught freely at the Academy of Athens or in Alexandria, and where his philosophy would have been welcomed with open arms. On the other hand, Christian writers had, very unsurprisingly, an opposing view. Augustine of Hippo, for instance, instead of seeing the sack of Rome in 410 as a punishment by the old gods for abandoning the old faith, praised Christianity for the unusual benign nature of the sack. Indeed, the sack was by ancient standards unusually benign, thanks to the fact that the Visigoths were by that time already Christians themselves, and thus inclined to spare their fellow Roman Christians and to just loot the city for three days. According to Augustine, previous disasters of Rome under pagan emperors were much worse compared to the sack of Rome, such as for instance the great fire of Nero in 64 AD or the great Antonine and Cyprian plagues. Other Christian writers agreed that they were actually living in quite good times compared to the old, brutal times, when Christians were at times persecuted and when the brutal practice of gladiatorial games was still allowed. That ancient bloody custom had been outlawed by the Western Roman Emperor Honorius in 399 and again in 404 and again by Valentinian III in 438, showing that quite a few outlawings were necessary in order to end that old and brutal tradition. Eusebius of Caesarea, for instance, a chronicler and theologian who wrote a panegyric about the life of the Emperor Constantine, also had some views about the Roman past. He saw Constantine's reign as a huge positive turning point for the Roman Empire, where the Roman Empire was reforged as something new and better than it had been before. Needless to say that he saw the early Romans as being under the influence of false gods and thus Christianity as the salvation of the Romans. Lactantius, another Christian writer who was active in the late 200s and early 300s, was not only a personal friend of Constantine, but he was also acting as tutor to Constantine's son Crispus. He was a Christian apologetic who defended the Christian faith against attacks by pagans and naturally, of course, he also saw Christianity as the salvation of the Roman Empire. It is thus interesting to see, and this makes absolute sense, 
that there was a very sharp divide between how late Christian Romans saw the early Romans and how late pagan Romans saw the early Romans. Pagans had a generally favorable view of the early Romans and Christians had a generally more disfavorable view of the early Romans. And they had a much more favorable view of contemporary times. Now, of course, this cannot be entirely generalized. There certainly were also Christians who looked back fondly onto the ancient times, but this is at least generally what we find from the sources and probably this was to some degree reflected in everyday people. Since most emperors themselves were Christians starting in the 4th century, it is unsurprising that some of them also had a negative view of the pagan past. Constantius II already, a son of Constantine, issued anti-pagan laws and these laws were of more draconic and severe nature as time passed. Many of these emperors therefore probably also had a disfavorable view of the Roman pagan past, not necessarily of the early Romans themselves, but they saw it as necessary to root out the old pagan past, if necessary, by force. But from many emperors we have no writings left and we can thus only speculate as to their worldviews through the laws they issued. For instance, Majorian most likely had a much more positive view of the old Roman past, despite being officially a Christian emperor, since in one of his laws he wanted to protect the old ancient buildings of Rome, issuing severe punishments for anyone caught in the act of destroying an old temple. From that we can derive that he must have probably had a very positive view of the past, something which was to be protected as some sort of national treasure. Others, for instance, such as Marcellinus of Dalmatia, even went further, openly declaring to be pagans even in the later 400s, being hardcore traditionalists, and so through their actions, they wanted to become the new Caesars or Augustuses of their times. Others again meanwhile, such as the Emperor Theodosius, probably saw the past as something that had to be cured by Christianity, if necessary by force. And so unfortunately, there is no generalized answer to how the late Romans saw the early Romans. It varied greatly depending on the worldview of each person. Some looked back fondly onto the good old days and others were happy that these days were over now, thinking to live in much better times. So we can see this is not so different from our own times, where views also differ quite strongly. Please like and subscribe so that you won't miss any future videos on the fascinating era of the late Roman Empire. And I would like to thank our new Kaisar supporter Rufus de Leon. Thank you so much Rufus de Leon or Rufus de Leon for supporting Majorianus in such a generous way. And I would of course like to thank everyone who is supporting Majorianus in any form, be it through Patreon, through a YouTube membership or through a PayPal donation. Thank you so much for supporting Majorianus so that I can keep this a channel about late Roman history. And if you want to learn more about the slow death of paganism in the Roman Empire, you can watch this video in the upper right corner. But if you want to learn more about the positive aspects of the Roman Empire becoming Christian, you can watch the other video in the lower right corner. I say thanks again to all friends of Roman history, gratias Tibiago and bene valete.